So next we'll briefly review the basic structure of a gene. And so again, um, you know, a lot of this course is, is centered around the human genome because that's, that's partly what I work on. And so, um, you know, the human genome again has around 3 billion uh, base pairs in it. Um, in terms of the number of actual protein coding genes, depending on how you count it, it's somewhere on the order of 20 to 25,000 uh, protein coding genes. And something really worth uh, mentioning and that we'll touch on again later is that uh, protein coding genes aren't the only kind of uh, genes in the genome. And so, uh, again, depending on you know how you count them, the number of genes that code for non-coding uh, RNAs, so that's basically genes that are transcribed to RNA, but are, you know, as far as we're aware, not really translated into proteins. Uh, there's on the somewhere on the order of 80,000 or more, probably more uh, of those. And so that just kind of gives you, gives you an idea that, you know, even though um, a lot of people spend a lot of time focusing on protein coding genes, there's actually a lot of non-protein coding genes out there in the genome. Uh, another thing worth uh, pointing out is that in organisms, you know, complexity as we kind of think about it intuitively, you know, if you're comparing like humans and dogs, you know, hopefully you think humans are more complex. Um, in organisms, complexity, as you probably know, is not really correlated with the number of genes or it's only roughly correlated with, uh, you know, the length of a genome. And so, you know, the human genome, for example, has somewhere on the order of 20 to 25,000 protein coding genes. Whereas the rice genome, for example, has like 51,000 or so. And so hopefully rice is not more complex than humans. Um, and so, uh, you know, and here on the right, I'm basically just showing you the, the old school central dogma of, of molecular biology, which just says that generally speaking, DNA, uh, you know, in terms of function, DNA is typically transcribed in RNA, which then uh, typically has to get translated uh, to proteins in order to perform function. But of course, um, as I just mentioned, we know that the central dogma is largely uh, incomplete in the sense that, of course, RNA by themselves perform a lot of function, for example. And so here I'm just illustrating the basic structure of a, of a classic kind of protein coding gene, um, and as well as some types of non-coding RNAs. Um, and so here, for example, uh, on the five prime end, you have a promoter element. Uh, you have uh, what turns into the five prime UTR of an mRNA. Um, and then you have exons, which are you know, spaced out by zero or more introns, uh, where the introns typically get spliced out, um, depending on how the splicing for a particular transcript works. And then you just uh, finish with the three prime, what turns into the three prime UTR of the mRNA. Um, and here basically, in, again, the, um, in terms of what actually uh, gets translated in the end, typically it's usually only the exons, although there's a lot of exceptions to that rule, um, and things like the promoter and most of the, in, you know, many of the introns, you know, typically get spliced out and so are what's referred to as the non-coding portions of the genome. And so during transcription, it's worth remembering that DNA is, of course, double-stranded. And so there's both uh, what's called the sense strand and an anti-sense strand. And so during transcription, the mRNA that's produced is typically an exact copy uh, of the sense strand, obviously converted to RNA from DNA. Um, and so for transcription to happen, then if the mRNA that's copied is a, is a copy of the sense strand, that means that RNA polymerase works by uh, reading off of the anti-sense strand. And so in the process of you know, RNA processing in general, what happens is that your kind of raw pre-mRNA transcript um, gets capped. And so a five prime cap in polyATL, generally speaking, uh, gets added to your pre-mRNA. And then some splicing happens to get rid of some of the, you know, some of the introns or all of the introns. And then generally speaking, um, you end up with a you know, mature processed mRNA that then potentially goes and gets translated. <laughs> And so we'll talk, about, we'll talk more about splicing later on in the, in the course, but basically splicing again kind of involves the process of uh, the cell deciding um, using, you know, a lot of cellular machinery, basically which uh, introns should get spliced out and 
almost equivalently decide which which exon should be combined together in order to form a mature uh, mRNA, which gets translated. And so depending on, uh, you know, basically people have come up with different types of terms for, um, you know, exons or introns, depending on um, whether or not they're kept or spliced out uh, by the splicing machinery. Um, and so the, I guess the most important point here is that, um, you know, exons basically can be included or excluded from given uh, from a given final transcript and one single protein coding gene which typically refers to the whole sequence DNA sequence encompassing both kind of all the exons and all the introns for a given um, set of transcripts uh, one gene can code for many many different uh, transcripts and so I really want to harp on this point that the protein coding regions of the genome actually occupy a very small proportion of the whole genome. And so in terms of the human genome, for example, uh, coding exons only occupy roughly 2% of the entire genome, and the rest of the 90% of the genome is non-coding DNA. And so it's still unclear as of today uh, what exactly is in all of that 90% of the genome. But roughly speaking, we think that uh, around 46% of the uh, human genome is repetitive sequence. And so within those repetitive sequences, there can be functional elements uh, that affect gene regulation and you know, cellular activity in general. Uh, roughly 25% of the genome is actually thought to encode different types of regulatory elements in RNA genes. And so in later lectures in the class, in particular in the epigenomics lecture, we'll talk about um, how to identify and, you know, what do those regulatory elements do? Um, but, you know, something that hasn't been really that appreciated until, you know, in the last 10 years or so is, is that a significant portion of the non-coding region of the genome is actually attributable to these regulatory elements. Um, and the rain, remaining 27% or so of the genome is thought to be mainly <clears throat> sequences like UTRs or introns of protein coding genes. So a fairly important question that we'll touch on in a number of places in this course are, is basically the question of how does how does one genome really encode a you know such a in the case of humans anyway such a huge diversity of uh, cell types um, you know and maintain you know that maintain distinct cell identity and function throughout the lifetime of a human so you know because again you know for the most part most uh, cells in the human body have the same genome, then, you know, how does that genome get used in so many different ways uh, for different types of cells and organs? And so in large part in the part that, you know, we'll explore in this class is part of that uh, reason is, is because of gene regulation, right? And so obviously we, we know from, from many of the other courses that there's many different types of, uh, you know, regulatory control of, of genes and, and proteins, right? And so um, the level at which we'll talk at uh, for most of this class is, is really at the level of transcriptional gene regulation, which basically just refers to the this part of the cellular machinery and genome, which which deals with the regulation of how genes are transcribed. And so some examples of, of how that might be done is, for example, um, the cell using various types of machinery to control access to different promoters at different times or in different contexts, um, you know, through the use of um, and basically through the use of things like activators or repressor proteins um, or DNA methylation. And so, of course, there's a lot of other forms of control that we won't really touch on, um, things that are related to post-transcriptional post control, translational or post-translational control as well. And so uh, the underlying theme here is that various types of DNA sequencing technologies can really help give us insight into uh, you know, these different methods of control. Um, for, you know, uh, through technologies like what's called ribosome uh, footprinting and things like this that we'll also touch on later. 